against week six components of hydraulic system. It's very important to know how to size those components and have some background on how they function. So where do we put the boiler? So where you put the boiler is based on the number of loops you have and how well you want to distribute the, the water, the hot water to the house. Also depending on the house construction. Was the house desi designed to function to function with hot water or was it forced air that you put the system later on? So that does all contribute to the boiler location. Also, we have to think about uh, codes. There's a lot of codes involved when it comes to location. So the location has to be approved by the building owner and also it has to be per code. <coughs> we'll call the code, local codes and also NFPA codes. Check local codes and national codes. And here are some of the things to consider. For oil inspection, use NFPA 31 as your primary code. That's the bare minimum. <coughs> NFPA 31. For gas installation, use NFPA 54. So that's something for you that for your disposal to make sure that it's per code. And the construction company, along with the whatever company you work for, should be responsible for putting the blueprints and telling you where to put the boiler. Or if it's your own business problem, you have to go check the code and make sure you are abiding to these codes. For electrical installation, NFPA 70. That's for connections coming to the boiler or the gas furnace. Check the venting system, so you have to consider the electricity. You have to consider the location for convenience for your piping. You have to check for your makeup water, your drainage, and also check for combustion air. So sometimes you want to have that very close to the vent or a chamber, and sometimes you have to have that go to the outside. Ensure that there's enough air coming into the boiler room. So again, something you have to think about is where I'm gonna get the air. Am I going to use the air inside the basement? Or I'm going to pull air from the uh, first floor? Or do I have to provide outside air? So we have two types of installation. One of them is called open installation. We're using air coming from the basement. Or you have sealed installation. <coughs> sealed installation is air coming from the outside. Okay? So make sure that the boiler is not installed in a laundry room, workshop, or pool area. And the boiler has to be sealed to avoid contamination. So if I'm going to install a boiler in a place where actually it's a finished basement and there are some people living there, make sure that you have a sealed installation because you don't want to vent anything to the basement. And also you want to have, be sure that you have plenty of air for the boiler. So that's something you have to also keep in mind for the location. Some codes require that the boiler is installed with different codes and, so, and local codes. So make sure you check with local codes. I know Westfield have their own codes. East Long Island have their own codes. So every city has its own codes. So you have to go with the NFPA, NFPA, CMR, and local code. Question? I've seen uh, plenty of boilers up in like in open basement with no other rooms. Yeah. Um, how would that work? Because it's not supposed to, and there's like laundry down there work. Well, depending on the space, is it confined space or is it not confined space? Depending on how big it is oh, of yeah. a basement. Like if it's big enough, that's fine. But you're not going to put your boiler in a laundry room that's designed only for the laundry sealed, room. Right. Yeah? Right. It doesn't have to be sealed. You want to make sure you have enough air coming in. Yeah. If the boiler is venting, so a masonry chimney. Make sure the chimney is in accord with the national fuel gas code. That means it has enough venting capability. It's not too long. So otherwise, what are you gonna do, Eric? <coughs> if, the, if, the, if, the, if the chimney is too long, what are you gonna do? Backdraft. Yeah, it's gonna, it's gonna backdraft. So what is the solution for this? No, you can't. I mean, you're not gonna change the chimney construction, you just look, you're going to go outside. You're gonna have a sealed construction and you're gonna have a, an opening just for that uh, boiler. So you're probably gonna put a uh, hole in the wall for that. Okay, uh, do we have some more? No, that's all. So 
Oh, yeah, more code. Check the foundation where the boiler is to be placed. Again, the boiler cannot be installed on combustible materials such as wood or carpeting. I know it's common sense, but you have to check. If it's wood floor, if you have, if you have hardwood floor in the basement, you cannot put the boiler on that basement. What are you gonna put? What, what is it supposed to be on? Concrete. Concrete. Concrete, concrete has to be a little bit elevated. It could be in the floor, or, but although that's not very, that's not ideal, especially for maintenance. I mean, you'll see how it's very uh, difficult to do maintenance on well, when it's floor level, so you want to put like 10 inch to 12 inch elevation to put the boiler on. For good practice, you want to have a pedestal the size of the boiler to put the boiler on. So it can be placed with carpet or combustible material. I have seen boiler install it on eggs. It's not concrete though. It's not coat. I mean, you've seen a lot, I mean, I've seen a lot of things, but it's not the coat. Oil or gas? Yes. Yeah. Yes. And they put a piece of concrete boiler. board under mine uh, yeah, in, in a, a utility furnaces room again. on the floor. But there was a concrete. And I've seen furnaces actually installed third floor <clears throat> and wood, but the bottom could not be covered with wood. They put probably a plate in it underneath or something. Because mm. again, you don't know what heat's going to come out of it. Or they'll freehand it. Yeah, 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 true. It could be on wall for gas. But for oil, you don't want oil. I've never seen oil. More than the, I mean, above the basement, usually in basement, just in case you have some kind of leak. <clears throat> so, a little foundation for the boiler to, uh, preferably, uh, on concrete slab that is level. Consider the entire system and the number of zones to reduce the piping requirement. So, if you have two zones, it's good to put it in the middle of those two zones so you don't have a lot of piping. A lot of piping means more pumping power, a lot of waste. And I'll show you how much you can waste out of a, a bare pipe. Make allowances for electrical work and control system to be accessible. Very, very important. When you install the boiler, make sure that it's really easy access to the aquastats, to the thermostat, to the uh, all other controls, all the valves. So give it some kind of space. Don't stick it to the wall because it will be very awkward to do maintenance. If you put the aquastat in the, in the side or like near the other side of the wall, it will be very difficult to change that uh, aquastat will do some wiring in it. And you will see that it's been done before, but it's really not uh, not convenient. So it's not, it's code, but I don't know, it's also like convenience. So it should be at least 18 inches from each wall. Uh, provide an extra 15% for total heating load in order to compensate for pipe losses and cold starts. So you have or it did that in your project. Search for equipment with acceptable AFUE in order to reduce the fuel consumption. So when you shop for equipment, make sure it has acceptable or reasonable audio fuel usage efficiency. So that means you have better combustion efficiency and better thermal efficiency. So look for something that's a little bit better for now. Condensing boilers are very common, especially where you have gas. So it's really good to have something uh, higher with, with uh, better efficiency. Check vent requirement for gravity system. That meaning that I will not, I will not have enough, uh, a lot of backdraft, and I will be able to, do, to vent outside. If it's necessary, you might need to put power venter. For, for example, if the chimney is too long and you have a lot of backdraft, I might have to do a power venter. When you put a power venter, make sure you put a draft door, one of these. Otherwise, you're going to pull air from, from the combustion chamber. And what does that do? You might have, you might put out the fire, and you might not like have complete combustion. So when you put a power venter, make sure you put one of these. Otherwise, for, for makeup air and. Uh, when you put one of these and you put power venter, what else should you consider? You don't want too much draft or it won't make the, the switch. True, but also let's say I'm in a basement, I put a power venter, I put one of those doors, what else should I make sure that I have? Makeup air. Mm. Where is the extra air gonna come from? Mm. So if you put a power venter with like at least five, 
C fin, what you say fin. Make sure you have an opening to make up for that there. Otherwise, you're gonna have black draft and a vacuum inside your uh, basement. Make sure the bed materials are approved by the local code for the specific appliances. We've seen PVC for vents, that's for condensing boilers, because the temperature is very low. And mostly we have tin or aluminum uh, vent. So now we look at the, the boiler. We know where we're gonna put the boiler. Again, always measure twice, cut once, put a layout, measure the layout, and have a plan of what you're going to do. Let's, uh, we can do, now we have to do, to do the loops. And you want for a three bedroom house, you want at least, I mean, depending on the size of the house, you want to at least have two zones. The more zoning you have, the more uh, efficiency the system will have, depending again on the size, especially if you have more than one floor. So, series loop, that's a series loop. It's very simple, very economical, easy to install, very intuitive, but you will have a lot of high pressure losses and temperature drop that will lead to uneven heating of the house. So this is what it looks like. So it's very simple and economical. It's ideal for a studio, one bedroom apartment, small loft, open space, that's doable. But this is what it looks like. So you have the hot water coming out of the boiler and goes through each radiator in series. So by the time you get here, probably you have almost no pressure. Almost, the water is almost room temperature or lukewarm, you're not gonna get a lot of heat. And if you look at that, this is one, two, three bedrooms and the dining with series loop. So all heating units are in series. So this is very similar to connecting loads in series. The first load will get 120 volts, second load will get 80, third load will get 40 and zero. So same thing, the water pressure will drop and the temperature will also drop. It's good. Economical, easy, but not for this size house. Again, it's good for small places, <coughs> studio, loft, open space, but if you have room, probably it's not going to be efficient at all. Question, anybody have that? Anybody seen that before? Yeah. Uh, on, uh, if, if the heating drop wasn't too bad, say for two or three of them, you could just do a return after like three and come back, right? You could. Or you could. just to make it a little more efficient. Yeah. You could offer that if you do the proper pressure drop. And we're not even concerned more mostly about the temperatures, about the pressure drop. What happened if the pressure drop? <laughs> the, the heat more quickly. The velocity will be very low. What happens if, if the velocity is very low? We want to have <coughs> class. If the velocity is, if it, is uh, very low, the first radiator will pull all the heat out, lose all the heat, and the radiator after that will have no heat left. So we'll probably have a high heating in this area and low heat in this area. One pipe system. One pipe. That's one pipe going all around the house. It has less fitting. High pressure drop, large circulator, small size unit only, cannot be used for indirect water heater. That's a one pipe system where you have one pipe coming from the boiler, coming back to the boiler, that's it. So it's easy to install, very intuitive, not that involved. So one series loop, single station again, a control, very economical to install. No zoning, high pressure drop, temperature drop and we're gonna have overheating and uneven heating. That's a one pipe system, one pipe coming out and coming back again. Simple, just like connecting loads in series. Okay, the picture done. So this is what uh, Tracy was thinking about. It's called series split loop. Still one pipe system. So we're still doing one pipe, but this time we have one pipe coming out, then we it splits in here. So again, this area will be a little bit warmer than this area. Because by the time we are through in here, and we have a return pipe, we'll have some coming to the bedrooms. So it's a split loop, 
but it's still considered a one patch system because the, this loop is connected in series or parallel. This is in series, and this is also in series, but this circuit and this circuit are in parallel. So it's a little bit better. You can have more zoning. You can zone this area with a thermostat and a zone valve, and they both go back to the boiler in the same pipe. So this comes out of from here. They both divert and come back to one, one pipe. So you split it from the source and it goes back here to one pipe. So at least this room and this room will have the same heat. And the bedroom here and the bathroom will have less heat, but eventually <coughs> they will go in one pipe. So again, it's a, it's a better design with this size house and the one series loop one, one after the other. So look at the control here. The loop splits in here. This is my pump. And balancing the valve to make sure the flow is even. And if you notice, the trunk here is bigger than the two branches. So it branches out here and goes to this loop and this loop. Temperature will be 180 and 180, then it keep dropping. And at the end, it will come back to one branch. Yeah. Let's say a house was built in series. Yeah. Can it be converted into that? Yeah. You can, you have to repipe it though. You have to repipe it. To bring at least one back somewhere in the middle of your system. Yeah, yeah. However way you can get it there. Yeah, so if, if you notice here, always having loops in parallel is better than in series. Even though this is a little bit like smaller parallel cir circuit, it's better than having all the loads are in series. And we said always a trick of the board over there for electrical. The advantage of having things in loads in, in parallel is the load is reduced. The total load is reduced for two loads. Uh, component that you see here, expansion, expansion tank, uh, vent for the water, and this is my pump. And if you notice, the pump is usually right after the expansion tank. What if you put the expansion tank after the pump? Probably. It's gonna suck a lot of the pressure. Yeah. So the pump pressure will be affected by the expansion tank because it has a flexible diaphragm in it. Okay. So for your project, probably by now you sized all of these radiators. Hopefully by today we have sized all these radiators. And now we can just do a schematic of how do we want to put these in your house. Advantage is simple again, it's cheaper than two pipe system. It can be zoned for each uh, loop. It has a better performance than a single loop. You will have an issue of overheating. The first radiator coming out of the branch, it will be uh, hotter than the other one. Temperature drop, and also thermostat location will dictate the heat distribution. Again, thermostat will turn on the system once the heat reaches that system. Okay? Questions? Options? Just give me your ideas. Uh, here is another one pipe system. Still, but this time, what is the difference? This is still a parallel system. It's still one pipe. But this will help us reduce the pressure drop what we put here is diverted teeth. So instead of the, all the water coming inside the, inside the one radiator that comes out, we'll take a portion of it. Aiden, <coughs> you notice the difference? So, so what, what is the difference between this system and the previous one? That one is split series. Yeah, it's split, so every radiator takes only a portion of the water, not all of it. So we have one supply pipe again, still the same, but each radiator will take a portion of the water, not the entire of it, the entirety of it. Like if you look, the previous system, the water will go all the way here completely and comes back again. Here we'll take only a portion, which is a little bit better. And this is called diverted teeth. So it will reduce the amount of pressure that comes out of here. 
So it's uh, again another idea of series circuit. By taking a portion of the pressure, not all of it, it will give you a better heat distribution, and hopefully the water will maintain temperature and pressure throughout the, the system, coming back all the way to the boiler. So we have three layouts now: either diameter T's, series circuit, and two loops series circuit. Question. Can you also put two circuits in that? Yeah, you could. <laughs> you could. But you gotta also think now with those diameter T's. They soak up a lot of pressure, so a lot of pressure drop. So you have to compensate with that pressure with a bigger part. But it, it is possible. That will give you better heating distribution, but you will have drop in the pressure. Question. Is this more efficient? In comparison, it depends on what you're looking for. I mean, for heat distribution, this is much better because again, we do not lose all the heat in one place. Mm -hmm. So the heat distribution will be much better. Question. What keeps wouldn't the water just go in the in the path of least resistance? Yeah. So, wh why wouldn't they put the heater? <coughs> oh, never mind. I just don't understand uh, how the water. Maybe it could just like bypass it. Yeah. Is there pressure? You, you, yeah, you answered your own question actually. That's is there good. pressure at the diverter T? Yeah. So the back pressure. Uh, yes. So Force go that okay. way. So if you look at it this way, this is my big pipe, right? Yeah. Yeah. And I'm coming up to the radiator. Diverter T is here, looks like that. Mm -hmm. It has a back on it. So the pressure here will be higher than here. So as, as the flow goes in here, this will have more resistance than this. So a little bit will go here, but some will go all the way here and keep going. That pressure will be caused by the flow going back in here, so you will have smaller pressure than the main pipe. So this will keep going, but a little bit will divert into the into the radiator. <coughs> yeah. It, what is the little things on the on the elbow sticking up? What do you mean? The little thing at the top of the elbow. He's one. Yeah. What's that? That's for a vent. They have them. Oh, is that a steam? No, no, it's water. It's water. Yeah. I'll but you need a vent on this kind. To calibrate it. Yeah, good question. So when the water goes back, it, that doesn't cause problems? No, uh -huh. no, because uh, this will only reduce the pressure, because partially will go in here and give it some some pressure, and this will go all the way here. Yeah. The, the vents, the vents, if you, is the first one you adjust it like a little tiny bit, and then the next one a little tiny bit, those vents, is that what makes the water go? Uh, the vents actually are really uh, important, because if you look, this is against gravity, uh -huh. Once you change something, you have to run the water and vent that air coming out of here. Otherwise, it's not going to come oh, out. Oh, just for the startup? Yeah. yeah. Oh, so it's not like a valve that opens No, no, no. It's no. spicy. Yeah. Otherwise, it will be almost impossible to get the water out of it, the air out of the it. The valve wouldn't be bad, though. Oh, if you, if you get just air each air. one. Huh? Yeah, yeah, if you get air in it, I was going to yeah. say. But during operation, yes. and it's running fine, you don't need it. That's why it's always the vent you want to be in the top of the system. A lot of questions. Again, coming out of the boiler, isolation valve. Uh, this is called the uh, air separator. Air separator, the vent, pump, and isolation valve. Why do we need isolation valve? To drain parts of it. If you, wanna, if you have to change the pump, it's good you have isolation valve. You have one also in here. So if you want to change any of those components, you're going to do isolation, paint them out, and put them back again using copper. The third part of that piece is a special piece. It's, yeah, it's called diverted teeth. And they suck up a lot of uh, pressure. This is what it looks like. So there's two of them here. It's one of the flow coming in. Flow coming out, you're gonna put one here, high pressure drop coming and going. Oh, I see. So inside the T, there's this little, little orifice. Uh, orifice? Yeah. Oh. But again, this causes higher pressure because of the size in here. 
and the water coming uh, in, in here, and these are the vents. And also you can put the radiator up or down. So if you have the, the radiator going downwards, you're gonna use the diverter T in the incoming. And if you have the, diver, uh, the radiator on the top, you'll put diverter T in the outcoming side. Pipe system. If you see now, we doubled the pipe size, mm -hmm. but this is connecting every radiator in parallel. If you notice here, we have one supply pipe. This pipe will take some of the heat and dispense whatever left over to another pipe. So this is our hot double neutral. So everything is connected in parallel. And second. Radiator will take the same thing, a portion, another portion, and until you go to the last radiator, and again you go back into the neutral again, and one pipe will go back to the to the boiler. Do those have diverter T too? No. No. In these ones you don't. So it has a reverse return. The return comes from each component. So we have one neutral, a one colder water and one hot, so it goes around. And this will give you the best uh, heat distribution and the lowest pressure drop. The problem with diverted heat, even though it's very simple, it's, there is a lot, a lot of pressure drop. This is the same thing as the, as the diverted T? No, it's not. So the T's that are in there are just regular T's? Regular T's. Like the same? I thought they would feed the radiator first and then each one would come back on a return. That's a different one? This is what's happening here. This is your return. Oh, okay. Oh, I see. Take a minute just to observe the, the picture and what's happening here. What is the difference between this one and this one? So this is completely different. You have one return pipe and one supply pipe and they will run next to every radiator. So you see two pipe system next to each other. One pipe will be return, one pipe will be supply. And this is something you want to actually invest in because for bigger houses, it, it makes more sense to have better heat distribution. The least losses you have to deliver heat, the better the system will perform. So in your project, you gotta put the floor plan and just do a schematic where the pipe will go, and that will help you also measure how long the pipe you'll need. The length of the pipe will also be a factor in the size of the pump you'll need. This piping now seems like really easy to put and draw, but if you don't have the right pump for that, probably you'll have an issue with the heat distribution. So two key elements for good distribution is the pressure and the water temperature. Water temperature supplied by the, by the boiler, and the pressure is supplied by the pump. Advantage has better performance than one pipe system, lower pressure drop, and it, it's very <coughs> balanced, meaning the temperature will be almost even in every pipe. It's expensive because again, we doubled the pipe and more installation, more soldering, more involved in installation again, more soldering, more elbows, and for you, you're gonna have to do also pricing, how many elbows you're gonna need, and you will need to know the elbows because what happened at every elbow to the flow? Pressure drop. Every time you have an L connection or a 90 degree, you're gonna have a pressure drop, pressure drop. <coughs> Those will all add up into what pump size you need to have efficient pump. More fittings, more pipes, more valves. Isolation valves are not cheap. Good quality isolation valves are around 40 bucks. And uh, those things you don't wanna skimp on because it's subject to a lot of heat, and eventually if the gaskets go bad, it will leak, and those things cost a lot of money to repair. Questions? Flow rate. So, if you want to talk about the flow rate, 
That's always in gallon per minute. So the flow rate of a, in a pipe that pulls the heat, to, to calculate the flow rate that's required for that series loop, will be the heat load for that series divided by 500 times delta T. And delta T is the temperature drop throughout that loop. From, so, the, from one point to another? Yeah. yeah. So let's think of this. Uh, Wait, you say delta T was temperature at the beginning and at the end? Yes. Okay. So if we look at this uh, house again, I'm going to do a small little flow plan. And this equation is in your, house, is in your book. So if you go here, radiator. And this is one loop. <coughs> I want to know what is the flow rate required for that loop. So I'll calculate T in and T out coming out of the loop. And what is the heat load? Let's say this is 3,000 BTU hour. This is 2,000 BTU hour. That's, that's how much the heat and heat supply for that loop. So the GPM required will equal the total heat load for that loop, which is 3,000 plus 2,000 over 500, which is a conversion factor. Times temperature difference, let's say we have here 180 and coming back as uh, 140, probably 40 degrees. And that will be our flow rate, which equals 5,000 over 500 times 40. Which is very low. The quarter, the GPM. That is my flow rate for the loop. That's the minimum flow rate. So, temperature difference is the temperature between the water entering the loop and the water leaving the loop. It depends on water velocity, pipe type, room temperature, how much I'm going to drop off the temperature. As a general rule, you want to use 20 degrees coming back and circulating. But if you have more than that, you can put whatever actually is happening in that loop. This is a big loop, it's as an example. But you usually want to drop 20 degrees at each radiator for each loop. So if you don't have a number, you can just put 20 and assume that, okay, I'm, I'll drop 20 degrees and come out with 60, 160 degrees of water temperature. Each loop, 20 degree drop. Yeah. So the number 500 is a conversion of water weight per gallon and minutes to hours. So it's going to always be 500, it does not change. So what do we need that for? Our, um, You're going to have to push water through the loop, size. right? Pump size. And we said the pump required two things, GPM and head. So that's for the GPM requirement for the pump. So now. We know, we know for each loop, we're going to put a pump in there and see how much flow rate is required for that loop. And based on the temperature drop. And again, pumps are inexpensive, and it's good to have more than one pump. Each loop should have its own pump. And uh, this is how we calculate the GPM for that. That's very small, uh, small based on this random example. Now you say this one loop, but you have <coughs> 3,000 BTU and then 2,000 BTU. Yeah. Is that two loops? No, it's one load, just put it, put it all together. 
plus it over gallon per minute? Yeah. Oh, it's one loop with two yeah. radiators yeah. and a return? Okay. Right. It's not so much. Yeah, it's very slow. But again, this, uh, this is a very random example. Let me show you how the math works. Okay? So next, we will Wait. do selecting the pipe size for the entire house and select the pump size. Question? We decided that that wasn't enough. Can we change the GPM to change our temperature difference? Yeah. You can always manipulate that. And this is what comes balancing the temperature, and that's why when you have a good design or bad design, some areas will be harder than others based on the design. And we do the split test without even doing any kind of calculation. You get areas that's really hot and areas that's really cold. I mean, we get a lot of complaints all the time. Yeah, I have a room that's colder than the other, and probably that's why nobody puts some thought into it. And uh, sometimes actually you don't need to, you can manage, but it's good to know how it's done. So next thing we'll select the pipe for the entire house, we'll do it after spring break. What pipe do we use for our residential? Most of we use three quarters. That's the most common size. But we'll tell you what does, what those three quarters came from. What is the basis for that? And how much heat do we lose out of a better pipe? And we'll select pump and expansion plug. We'll spend another two weeks doing that. For now, I want you at 1.30, we'll get together and at least have the heating load, cooling load, and the uh, radiator side. Today we do. Yeah. Yes. Okay.